Hello and welcome to tonight's date from the RSGB. Contesting is a really enjoyable aspect of the hobby for many amateurs, although it's fair to say that the majority use the HF or VHF bands. But as we will see, contesting at microwave frequencies is also gaining in popularity. And tonight we're joined by RSGB microwave manager Barry Lewis, G4SJH, to tell us more and explain how you can get involved. So a very warm welcome to tonight at 8, Barry. Could you give us a quick overview of what you'll be covering tonight? Yeah, certainly, David. Thank you very much. And a very good evening to you and to, to everybody. And uh, thanks to the RSGB for inviting me to, to come and talk to you this evening on your Tonight at 8 uh, series. So, uh, yes, the talk this evening is aimed at uh, uh, hopefully newcomers who may be uh, thinking about getting involved in contesting in the microwave bands. Um, actually, contesting in those bands is not so very different to, uh, to contesting in the lower bands, but there are some additional considerations to, uh, to think about. So we'll be covering some of those in my, in my talk, as well as looking at the opportunities for, for operating some of the calendars, the frequencies we, can op frequencies we can operate in, and some of the operational aids that we have to help us make successful QSOs. Thank you. Well, we look forward to that, Barry. And before your presentation, a reminder that if you at home are watching this on Monday, the 6th of March, then this is live. And you can ask questions and make comments on either BATC or YouTube at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. Also, please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now, let's go back to Barry to find out more about microwave contesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again, David. And uh, yes, again, good evening, uh, everybody. As uh, David uh, introduced me, I'm Barry G4 SJH. I've been the RSGB microwave manager for uh, a number of years now. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm a relatively active uh, microwave contester myself. So hopefully I can share uh, also some of my personal experiences with you uh, this evening. And as I said, the talk is aimed really at, um, you know, potential newcomers, people who may be um, already uh, busily participating in UHF and VHF contests and maybe HF contests as well. And uh, starting to wonder, well, what happens in these uh, higher frequency uh, mystery bands up here above one gigahertz? So hopefully we can um, open the door a little bit on, uh, on what happens there. So um, usually the first uh, thing that happens when uh, we talk about operating in the microwave fans um, is, um, and I've seen this from presentations in, in clubs and so on, is that uh, people often see a number of challenges that are perceived um, to be associated with, with not only activity but also contesting in the bands uh, above one uh, one gigahertz. Um, a number of these might be uh, things like the following: the propagation uh, environment uh, perhaps is is not very well understood. Um, there is a kind of an assumption um, that uh, microwave frequencies are only good for line of sight. Um, uh, contacts and, and paths, which is uh, certainly not the not the case. Um, equipment availability is is often cited also as uh, an issue. There are fewer uh, commercial radios uh, available for use in the bands above one gigahertz. We know that some do cover um, at least the one point three gigahertz band, but once you start to move above that, then the the availability starts to uh, drop off very quickly. Um, so this leads to a kind of assumption that there are a lot of technical difficulties um, to, to getting involved in, in activities in these frequencies, um, maybe because um, the low availability leads people to assume you have to build um, equipment. But today there are a lot of uh, kits and modules available that can make this, uh, make this easier. And the cost of equipment. Actually, I should have put that at the top of the list because that's actually the first uh, point that usually gets raised, people say, well, isn't operating on in microwave frequencies uh, uh, very expensive? And uh, again, it, you can spend as much as you want, really. Um, of course, you can make it expensive or you can make it as cheap as you as you can, um, by whatever means you, you, you have. Um, so there are opportunities. Um, I think one of the uh, uh, first ones is that the the way you operate or the way operations go in, in contests in the, in the microwave frequencies is far less uh, intense 
um, compared to activities in UHF, VHF, and certainly HF uh, bands. Here, there's a smaller community of, uh, of operators, shall I say, that you'll, you'll come up against. And quite often, um, and particularly in the higher frequencies, um, there's even a bit of time for, for a little bit of uh, chit chat. So, uh, you know, you can get uh, a little bit beyond the uh, 5 and 9 uh, 001 um, kind of point in the QSO. And uh, in that sense, um, the, the contesting can seem a little bit more uh, friendly, even though there's still a competitive edge to uh, what is going on. Um, with the um, with activities in these bands attracts uh, obviously fewer people at the moment compared to the lower bands, uh, which means that you're in a, a, a smaller pool of, uh, shall I say, participants. So I think this means you can have uh, perhaps a better chance of, of being successful um, compared to perhaps in the lower bands where you may get hundreds of, of entrance into a, into a contest. So it's, it's quite likely that uh, if you're successful, you can see yourself uh, towards the top end of uh, the results tables um, uh, but well, a higher likelihood of that happening compared to perhaps um, in the lower operating in the lower uh, frequencies. Um, the uh, touching on the uh, element of experimentation, uh, quite often um, people are building uh, equipment of their own or putting together systems of their own uh, rather than as I said earlier buying commercial radios and this means that with the less intensive operating, there's a little bit more time for trialing and experimentation. And uh, quite often in the uh, in the higher frequency uh, contest, if you're, you know, want to try out uh, maybe a different front end uh, low noise amp or something like that, that you can readily uh, change over, then quite often people are willing to spend a few moments, um, you know, helping out with your experiments and perhaps giving you uh, results or some feedback on, on how equipment um, maybe uh, maybe performing. So this is a good opportunity for this. Plus the fact that the with the scheduled operating periods, which is on the next bullet there, um, you know that there are occasions when, for sure, there will be people on the air on these frequencies, and um, and you know you can have these opportunities to 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 experiment and, and trial your your equipment. Um, yep, scheduled operating periods. Uh, there are many, and uh, we'll come to those in a minute. So, as I said, you can be sure that when you go on the air um, and you plan to go on the air, you know that there will be other stations. Um, unfortunately, it's not like operating in the HF bands where uh, quite often there are people uh, monitoring the bands sort of 24-7. Uh, um, it's not like that in the, uh, in, in the gigahertz bands for sure. And... You can have opportunities not just with uh, voice communications or, or CW and, and that kind of thing, uh, what I call narrowband applications. There are also uh, contests um, in the TV and the amateur TV domain, um, and they also take place uh, in some cases in, in microwave frequencies. So if you have this kind of double interest of, of TV as well as a microwave, then you can have opportunities uh, to satisfy both those uh, urges <laughs> and, uh, and operate in a, in a microwave uh, a contest in the, uh, in the television uh, domain as well. So the frequencies that we are talking about are listed here. And uh, we can start at the top of the box on the left there. Um, if my cursor wants to come on screen. Yes, here it is. Um, the, the top band there is the, the famous or well-known 23 centimeter band, uh, 1240 to 1325 megahertz. This is uh, by far the uh, most popular uh, frequency range for, for contesting and, and often really an entry point, really, I suppose, for, for participating in these, uh, in these microwave contests. Many folks, I think, have started on, on 23 sems and, and then as the, uh, the, uh, they get the, um, uh, the bug, they start to move up in, in frequencies. So this is clearly the most popular band. And, of course, there are some uh, commercial radios which are available for that frequency range too. So this makes it very convenient and uh, relatively easy to, to set up. Let me go up through a 13-centimeter band around 2.4, uh, 2.3, 2.4 gigahertz here. This is in two tranches um, these days. And uh, there is actually an additional band uh, down below uh, 2310 or 2300 to 2302, 
which was also available to us in the UK under uh, NOV. So there's um, a couple of bands there which are which which can be used in in, in contest uh, uh, in in the 13 centimeter area. Then we have nine SEMs, 3.4 gigahertz, six SEMs, uh, 5.7 gigahertz, and and then we come to 10 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz band, uh, three centimeter band, um, and that's also in in two chunks. Um, then we move up into the, uh, I suppose, what you would call really the sort of millimeter wave uh, area of the spectrum. I mean, technically, it's probably not until you get about 30 gigahertz of this millimeter wave, but uh, we put uh, 24 gigahertz into that basket too. So here you see the much higher frequencies. These are all part of our uh, lasting schedule, 24, 47, 76, 122, uh, 134, and, and 250 uh, gigahertz. These are all um available and there are sessions uh in which all of those bands can be um can be activated um but it's fair to say that the level of uh, activity and the number of participants as you go down this list does uh, decrease uh quite uh, quite dramatically so i think in 23 centimeter band you might see in a um let's say an active uh, uh session Perhaps 150 stations, maybe 200 stations uh, on on the on the band. I think when you get down to the, the sort of 24, 47 gigahertz area, then that number is is sort of probably around about a dozen, um, maybe uh, maybe even uh, maybe slightly more. Um, but it tends to be a very kind of regional sort of activity. Uh, but there's certainly uh, interest in in all those bands, and there are uh, competitive events that take place in in all those bands. So all the bands are available to uh, for license holders uh, at uh, full power. Um, the uh, intermediate licenses can also licenses can also get access to all the bands, although the power is restricted to 50 watts. But you know, quite honestly, that is really not a problem. I think much above about uh, these sort of lower uh, three bands, up to about 3.4 gigahertz. Once you get above that, I think. If you can get 50 watts uh, out of your equipment, uh, you're extremely lucky. <laughs> so uh, I don't think that's really a block. For foundation license holders, then uh, unfortunately only the 10 gigahertz band is is available with a one watt power limit. But even a one watt power limit, I can tell you, is is not really a block to making a reasonable uh, contact. Um, I think I'm not entirely sure, but I think that the only other stipulation for the foundation license is that there may be some uh, problem with, with not using uh, commercial equipment. That's something I, I haven't checked, but I think that might be the case. So all the activity is in accordance with, uh, with the UK ban plans, of course, um, but there are usually centers of uh, activity. So even though some of these bands look quite wide, um, you know, several tens of megahertz at the lower end and, and even uh, uh, several gigahertz wide at the top end, um, then there are often centers of activity where the, the, the sort of contest activity um, focuses on. For some reason, it's always around about decimal 200 <laughs> in the band. So if we take uh, 23 SEMs, of course, we have 1296 decimal 200. In uh, 13 SEMs, 2320 decimal 200. And so on and so forth. The 10 gigahertz is 10 decimal 386 decimal 200. Uh, and so it seems to go on, but uh, there we are. I think that's just a, a kind of tradition um, as, uh, as things have uh, moved forward. So those those are the bands that we are talking about. <clears throat> so when are those periods that we can uh, expect to see activity and who organizes the, uh, the events that take place? Um, so really uh, we have, first of all, the, the, the RSGB contest calendar and Probably, if you're active already in VHF and UHF contests, you're familiar with the uh, with that contest calendar, and of course the RSGB uh, contest committee that uh, does the work to organise the um, the calendar. And in that, you're probably aware uh, of the UK uh, activity uh, nights, the UKAC sessions, and um, that happen every month in a number of bands. Well, you you'll probably also know that 1.3 gigahertz band 23 SEMS features in that uh, suite of activities once a month. So uh, at least one evening in every month, there's a two and a half hour session where you can find uh, plenty of activity on the 23 centimeter band. And there's quite a few stations that are, that are quite active. It's quite a competitive series of events. 
And uh, in addition to that, we also have the uh, the higher frequency session in the UKAC uh, group, the SHF session, which follows, I think, the week after, usually, the 23 centimeter event. And that covers all bands from uh, 2.3 gigahertz up to 10 gigahertz. So again, once a month, there's a you know virtually guaranteed activity period of two and a half hours on a uh, Tuesday evening. It's always on a Tuesday um, where these bands are being activated. Um, and actually, it's interesting that the, this uh, UKAC um, idea has been picked up uh, in, in a number of countries nearby as well. So even in some of our nearest neighbours in the continent, they have activity evenings, activity days um, on a similar kind of basis to the uh, to those that we have in the UKAC. So this provides uh, good opportunities for, um, for for these kind of activities. Um, in addition to the UKACs, then there uh, are trophy events run by the RSGB, or shall I say adjudicated, or coordinated and organized by the RSGB, a 1.3 and 2.3 gigahertz, and, uh, and a 10 gigahertz. And these happen uh, once a year. And there are two sessions through the year where we have every band from UHF up to 245 gigahertz uh, in a, a contest period, I think, 24-hour uh, um, May, uh, in, one in May and one in October, so that happens twice a year. And of course, 1.3 gigahertz is a band that is included within the VHF field day activity. So, just taking the RSGB event, there's plenty of scope for uh, for, for activity there. And and I think it's quite interesting that the, the UK ACs have certainly, I think, attracted um, you know a lot of interest. And and even in the SHF frequencies, we've seen um, experimental stations coming on just to make a few contacts, um, because in some cases, just a few contacts is enough to, to, to get you a good position in the, uh, in the tables. Um, I have to wave a flag now also for the UK Microwave Group. Um, this is a special interest group affiliated to the, to the RSGB. You, uh, I'm sure you will have heard of them and, and hopefully come across them. Um, the UK Microwave Group uh, represents the, the interests of, uh, of, of all the amateurs who want to operate in bands above one gigahertz that's their focus and they also of course organize uh, activity and contest events and you can go to their web pages uh, to, to to look at those they have uh throughout the year uh, at the weekends uh they have these cumulative sessions in the 1.3 2.3 and 3.4 gigahertz bands so-called low band low bands um and there are five of these throughout the year and these are very uh very, very interesting because um as with other cumulative sessions, what happens here is that you um, you can take part in five events, but your best three scores count to your um, your uh, winning uh, score at the end of the uh, at the end of the year, um, and this gives you a bit of flexibility because you know sometimes we can find that our weekends are very crowded uh, with all this activity going on and all sorts of other pressures on our lives. Sometimes not possible to participate in them all. But, um, you know, you can uh, usually miss a couple and uh, not feel that you've uh, lost all your, your chances. So these are, are very interesting. They last usually on a Sunday for around about six hours, starting at around March. Actually, yesterday was the uh, first session. And uh, they go up until November is the, uh, is the last session. We have uh, in the mid-band area, 5.7 and 10 gigahertz. We also have cumulative sessions, five of those throughout the year. They tend to start around about May and I think finish at the end of October, if I remember correctly. And then in, in the even higher bands, the millimeter wave bands, there are four cumulative sessions through the season, through the year, uh, covering the three bands you can see in the slide there from 24 up to 76 gigahertz. And it's quite interesting uh, that I think just recently there's been a bit of an uptick in uh, in interest, I think, in certainly in 24, the 24 gigahertz band, there's been a fair deal of... Uh, surplus equipment and uh, what have you coming on them or becoming available that has um, um, promoted uh, so some extra activity in those bands, I think, which is which is good to see. And then other bodies, as I said, the uh, British Amateur Television Club, they uh, are offer weekend activity for TV enthusiasts in 1.3 and 2.3. Um, you can see there's several or many sessions, actually 12 sessions annually for 1.3 and several for 2.3 and up. Um, so that's why I say you can wear out your TV equipment if this floats your boat and, uh, and do microwaves there as well. 
And then in addition, the IARU uh, Region 1 uh, organizes contests in the, uh, the cover the microwave bands, and some of these are coincident with some of these activities that we see in the UK calendars, uh, either for the RSGB and uh, the UK microwave group. And, and then there's EME, Earth, Moon, Earth um, contests can also include activities in the, uh, in the microwave bands, certainly about 1.3 gigahertz. Um, and some activities even in, in frequencies uh, beyond and above 1.3. So plenty of sessions, plenty of opportunity to um, get your equipment out in the field or wherever you operated from and, and take part in these events. So um, what do you need for, uh, for your station? What extra uh, elements might be needed for you to be, let's say, successful or carry out successful QSOs in the uh, gigahertz uh, band. Well, you can um, you can see from the um, activity tables that there are both uh, home stations and portable stations uh, participating in, in all these events. And uh, I think as you go up in frequency, um, we find that uh, the number of portable stations, relatively speaking, tends to, to increase. Some people are very lucky, um, shall I say, <laughs> and that's not me, <laughs> to uh, have a home station yeah. which is in a good location uh, with perhaps a good takeoff, not too much uh, clutter and blockage around them, and uh, they can operate very effective stations from their uh, home location. Um, in, in bands up to even um, 24 uh, gigahertz um, without too much uh, difficulty. But for me, that's not the case, and uh, I'm not lucky like that, so I have to be a, a portable station proponent, I have to say. Um, and I think if you're, um, if you're at home, then that's fine. You, you, you've probably spent a lot of time already setting up your station, um, you have uh, elements of your high frequency system, be it a transverter uh, and, and so on, or power amplifiers or low noise amplifiers, perhaps already installed up your mast. All you need to do is switch on your equipment and uh, let it stabilize perhaps and make sure your rotator is working and, and kind of away you go. Um, but if you're portable, then it's a little bit more tricky, shall I say, and uh, you have to take a little bit more care. So. There are a number of uh, elements that you probably need to think about if you're not familiar with uh, portable operating. So the first thing that I'd say is that usually for operating operation in these bands, you will, will have some kind of transverter system. This requires you know, a low frequency VHF or UHF uh, transceiver uh, hooked up to a uh, frequency converter system. I think we all know what transverters are. And, um, you know, you have to power all this equipment. Uh, you may have, again, some elements of that perhaps remote from the uh, transceiver itself, maybe uh, up a, a mast or, or on a tripod or something like that. Um, this means there can be uh, a lot of um, connections and uh, setup that needs to be carried out before you can actually start operating from your fabulous portable location that you've been able to find. So... Really, allow yourself proper time to set up. This is something that uh, I think everybody uh, has come across at one time in, in their portable uh, life. Um, it's very easy when you're in a hurry and maybe the elements are against you a little bit to, to make mistakes with, uh, with your setup and your equipment. You can um, you know, plug your power leads in the wrong way around. You can stuff the wrong RF cable into the wrong port. And, uh, and it only takes a moment and, uh, and then all your uh, efforts are in vain because you've blown up your gear and you've got to take it all down again. So um, this is something that uh, really is quite important. Allow yourself the proper time to set up your portable um, uh, station. Um, is the equipment weatherproof? I mean, you know, kind of obvious, but, but you know, sometimes it's so easy to underestimate uh, how uh, challenging the weather can be when you're, when you're portable. As the, uh, the two pictures at the bottom can uh, testify to, um, suddenly you can have a rainstorm. And, um, you know, if you've got any little gaps in your equipment, you can get water getting into PAs and things like this. So this is important. Um, supporting the antenna. 
uh, is is uh, obviously kind of important. Well, of course, we don't want the thing blowing over anyway. Um, but you want it to be stable uh, because, as we'll see, it's very important that your antenna uh, heading and directivity is, is, is carefully uh, managed. Um, so you need to have a stable support for your antenna. It needs to be able to withstand the, the howling gale that you might be subject to for the most of the day. Um, you will probably need to guide down um, or maybe it'll be on a sturdy tripod. And uh, I think even with a sturdy tripod, as again, the picture on the right hand side will show you, um, can still be blown over. So even though you think your tripod is super heavy and uh, planted on the ground, um, believe me, when you get a gust of wind strong enough, it can even take that down. And uh, this is unfortunately what happens to a, a 60 or 90 centimeter offset dish when it goes flat onto the ground. <laughs> so uh, yeah, very important, all these considerations. How will you supply power? Um, if you're lucky enough to have a generator and, and you can run your equipment from mains, then this can be uh, uh, useful. Um, not always everyone's cup of tea because you, then you need to have fuel and things like this. Or maybe you need batteries. So batteries are, are a good uh, substitute. You need to make sure they're charged or they've got a capacity to last for the session and for the whole of the contest session, which could be, um, you know, six, eight hours, something like that. So um, I recommend good uh, high capacity leisure batteries. These seem to be very resilient and uh, able to withstand the, the, the charging and discharging uh, cycles of, uh, of portable operating. So good batteries and a good stable, solid uh, power supply for, for your equipment. Um, and your operating uh, position. Um, you know, you can be, um, you might have to be outdoors um, you've got to think about whether you can um, hear your radio while perhaps you need to uh, alter the heading of the antenna. Um, will you better hear it in the, when the wind's howling around the corner of the car? Um, if you try to operate with inside, inside a vehicle, is there enough space? Some people are lucky enough to, to have vehicles that uh, they can fit out so that they can uh, op uh, work from an operating position inside the vehicle, maybe like a minibus or a van or something like that. Um, but again, not everybody has that opportunity. And probably when you're starting out, you, you probably want to try something a little less um, um, easier to, something easier to uh, to, to set up than, uh, than uh, a little less ambitious, that's what I'm looking for, than, than a whole sort of operating uh, van. Um, yeah, so you need to think about all these elements. And I can tell you that whatever you think is easy, in the shack to uh, connect up and set up and get running is 10 times more difficult when you're standing on top of a windy uh, hilltop. That is absolutely for sure. And you need all these things actually not just for, uh, it's not just for contesting. I mean, any activity, any operating in the microwave, microwave frequencies needs all these things to be uh, considered if you don't want to, you know, damage your equipment and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, we talked about uh, antennas or touched on antennas briefly on, on, the, on the last slide. So this is something that uh, starts to become a little bit more critical uh, if you're operating in, in the microwave frequencies. And this is the uh, precision and stability of the uh, antenna, uh, antenna heading. Um, and this becomes increasingly important as the frequency increases. Um, so just in this little sample um, estimation here on the slide, if we take, for example, a 60 centimeter diameter parabolic dish antenna, um, we can see that as the frequency increases, so the gain is increasing of that antenna, but the beam width is narrowing quite considerably. So what can work at 2.3 gigahertz with a beam width of 15 degrees and probably is quite easy to, to point and maintain on heading becomes somewhat more challenging when you're moving up to uh, 10 or 24 gigahertz. And this is important because you can be just a few degrees off. And if you're trying to pick out a very weak station, you, you won't hear anything. And um, quite often, um, you know, if you can hear just something of the signal from the far end, um, you have something to work with. But if you don't catch anything, um, then you really don't quite know, you know, how you can, what you can do to, to, to bring that signal in and make it a little bit stronger. So it's quite important that you know exactly where your, your, your antenna is pointing. And this goes for a home station as well, of course. It means that you need to have a good quality rotator if you're in a home station that you can uh, rely on and know that it'll set repeatedly um, in terms of its position. 
So this is something that becomes a little bit more challenging. So you need to make sure you know um, how you can calibrate and how you can maintain your antenna heading and keep it um, keep it stable. Something that's a little people might find a little odd. Um, maybe not if you're if you're uh, experiencing VHF and UHF, but certainly if you're an HF operator, um, is that you need to know something probably already about where the remote station is that you're trying to work. And this again is really a uh, a function of this uh, very narrow beam width of the uh, of the antennas in the microwave frequencies, um, because you need to know where to point your your antenna. And even though you can call uh, for random or CQ randomly, shall I say, on on the 1.3 gigahertz band on 23 centimeters, and people do, um, you can hear this uh, all, all the time in, in the UK ACs, and you'll find that as you go up in frequency, this happens less and less because you can see with, with beam widths of, you know, less than five degrees and sometimes even less than two degrees, you really have very little chance of, 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 uh, of having a heading that is coinciding with a uh, remote station. Um, so the higher frequencies, increasingly, the QSOs need to be kind of set up. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, the uh, six-figure QRA locators are used for the lower frequencies. So these are, uh, of course, useful for, for calculating uh, headings. There are several ways to do that. Um, and for shorter paths, actually, certainly in the millimeter wave bands where the paths can be uh, relatively short, then the eight-figure QRA locators are used um, mainly for, for scoring because the uh, granularity of the six-figure uh, locator system is a little bit uh, too, too high. Um, so in order to set up these uh, remote stations uh, ahead of the actual QSO, um, there is a talkback or requirement really for some kind of talkback channel um, to allow you to set up these um, uh, QSOs. <clears throat> so we can deal with that, talkback channels. So very often the uh, contest, uh, CQ contest calls are quite often initiated in the uh, talkback channel. This could be, there are several options uh, for this, uh, some of which are more popular than others. Um, VHF and UHF talkback. This is uh, in either two meters or, uh, I suppose usually two meters, but it can happen in 70 centimeter band as well. Um, and this gives you a, a real time talkback, which is actually, uh, which can be actually quite useful. And actually tends to be more um, popular in the very much higher bands, 24, 47 gigahertz and so on, where there could need to be a little bit more time spent actually setting up the uh, the QSO. And it's useful to have real-time feedback on what might be happening at the, uh, the far end. Um, but even in, um, certainly at, um, probably less so in 13 SEMs, th certainly not in 23 SEMs probably, but in 13 SEMs, uh, VHF, UHF toolbar might be used, but as you go up in frequency, it, it becomes more, more and more um, used. And in, in, and in two meters, 144.375 is the recognized VHF microwave toolbag frequency, and this is where you go to hear people calling CQ microwave contest if there's an activity session taking place. So clearly, if you go out portable, then you'll need to have some way of, of having a, a VHF uh, link as well. Maybe only a small five element, two meter beam or something like that, just on top of your, your antenna pole is, uh, is, is enough. Um, there are other means that require uh, internet connectivity and data connections when you're on a remote location. Um, so Zillow is, is one app that, that was, uh, actually I'm not sure how popular that it is at the moment. There are some folks who are, are using this, but it's certainly not the most popular uh, means to, uh, to talk back. But by far the most popular means is the ON4 KST a chat room, so-called KST for short. Uh, and that also requires a uh, an internet connection in order to make that work. So if you are out portable, then you need to be able to provide that, maybe with tethering from your mobile phone or some other way to connect to the, uh, to the internet. If you're in a home location, of course, that's relatively straightforward. You no doubt everybody pretty much will have a broadband connection these days that can uh, support the... Uh, KST chat room. Actually, the data demand is not, is not terribly high. Um, so it works well even over mobile phone uh, uh, tethering out in the field as well. And it is probably the most popular uh, means of talkback, but it can get busy. Um, and I'll show you a screen in a minute in case you're not familiar with this. 
but in the chat room you can see who is uh, who is on the band, uh, who is active, um, and you can exchange messages with them and and use that to set up uh, the QSO. The perhaps one of the downsides of Kirsty is that it is very popular, and if you're in one of these uh, events that is uh, international, perhaps uh, an event that coincides with an uh, IARU event in Europe, then you will be there will be many many stations. Uh, using the uh, the chat room, and um, you can you can see that the uh, the messages are flying down the screen very quickly. Um, that it does alert you when there's a message directed to you, but sometimes even that can fly off the screen so fast it's easy to to miss. And there are some additional tools that can allow you to uh, target the messages that you see uh, to those that are uh, addressed to uh, to yourself. Um, KS to me, KST to me is one of those. Um, although I think recently that's been changing. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't had a KST to me um, facility. You have to get a special, uh, key, a specific key to enable that. I haven't done that. Um, but I know looking at some of the uh, email traffic that it seems that there's some, uh, maybe some difficulties at the moment with that uh, with that tool. But there are other means to, uh, to provide the... Uh, slow down the uh, scroll rate on the screen and, and get messages targeted for yourself. And of course, if all else fails, then you can <laughs> ring the person, <laughs> hopefully on their mobile phone. Most people have these these days, but that's probably, um, you know, desperate measures um, if, you've, uh, if you've got to resort to the mobile phone. However, the cardinal rule, of course, is that once you've set up the QSO, you cannot exchange the um, contest information the, the QSO information, which is usually the report and the serial number of the contact, must not be uh, made or verified over the uh, over the talk bank. Of course, people are listening, so um, if you were to do this, then it would soon become uh, become apparent. So this is a rule in the uh, in most of the contests. You'll see that uh, talk bank is allowed by any means, um, but uh, the uh, contest exchange must not be made in the talkback channel. <clears throat> so this is what KST chat room looks like. I know all you seasoned microwave operators who are no doubt on this uh, listening to the talk will be very, very familiar with this, as will people probably in the VHF and UHF bands. But for those who are not, um, it's a very useful uh, facility run uh, by donations uh, by uh, Mr. Owen for KST. I can't remember his name, actually. Um, has done for many years uh, on servers uh, located somewhere, um, and uh, it runs very effectively. When you go to the uh, the web page, you will be faced with this uh, screen of uh, options for the frequency band that you want to uh, uh, take an interest in. So you can see everything here from 28 megahertz up to uh, uh, other other HF bands and what have you. And then here you can see enter into the microwave world here. Um, so that's the one you want. And uh, once you've uh, logged in there, because you do need to register and provide your password, um, you will see a screen which hopefully will look a little bit like uh, the screen at the bottom of this slide here. This is an extract from the screen showing just the important, um, well, what I consider really the important dialogue boxes here. Uh, with first of all, on the right hand side, uh, you can see the stations that are active on, on, on the chat room on KST. You can see their locator and a little message maybe about their name or maybe which bands are on because it might be a multi-band activity and so on and so forth. And then you can see that I've had to log in, of course, in order to get these screens. So there's me just on the top of the uh, the, the list there. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, the messages uh, coming in in time order. And you can see even in this minute, 2014, and this was taken during a uh, one of the uh, UKAC SHF events, probably uh, maybe last week or something. You can see even in that minute, um, there's a whole host of uh, messages just from stations in the UK. So you can imagine if you've got a European activity, that is like you know four times as many scrolling down uh, every minute. So um, yeah, you've got to be uh, sort of on your toes. Um, but yeah, very important. Um, uh, Talkback method and um, very popular um, uh, these days. So, what else do we have? Okay, uh, I can't see my slide. Oh, operating Air Scout. Okay, oh, operating aids. Sorry, Air Scout comes next. <laughs> operating aids. Um, 
yeah, what else is useful? Beacons. Beacons are a very uh, useful um, uh, item, uh, facility to have available to us. Uh, of course, you know, installed by, by volunteers and groups all over the country. Uh, and these are useful not just as propagation indicators, of course, because they do vary even in the microwave bands, but uh, they're very helpful for setting up your antenna heading uh, if you need to calibrate it, certainly if you're out portable, and maybe even if you're in a home station as well, of course. Um, this uh, it, it can be quite tricky if you've got to try and set up a, a tripod and a system on a, on a tripod and you can't really... Um, you know, definitively set the, the heading because you need to be within, let's say, three degrees. Um, compass doesn't quite uh, cut it, and certainly not a compass on a mobile phone. Um, so um, if you can hear a beacon, then you'll know where that is, and, and you can uh, calibrate your, uh, your, your heading uh, based on that. And there are beacons available in all the bands from 23 sems right up to 134 gigahertz. The, uh, the number of them in each band uh, vary. And uh, you can look in the UK on this uh, uh, web resource here, UK Repeater Net, uh, to find where they are. And there are two uh, examples here, one for the left-hand side for the 3.4 gigahertz band, shows the location of the beacons in the UK. And uh, here's another example for the 24 gigahertz band, showing those uh, available also in the UK. If you look on the European resource here, then you can see also the beacons that are located in the near continent, which can also be uh, useful, particularly for, for propagation uh, indications if you want to see if it's possible to, to work uh, near continental uh, stations and so on. Of course, um, this doesn't mean, um, unfortunately, the, the, the fact that there are beacons indicated on the map doesn't guarantee, <laughs> unfortunately, that they're all operational. Um, yeah, so this could be a, a little bit of a problem. Uh, and of course, you know, we all know that uh, beacons can come and go for all sorts of reasons, um, some of which can be quite difficult to, to solve. But um, yeah, you certainly be wanting to, to understand a little bit where beacons might be for the band that you want to operate in and certainly make use of them for, um, you know, if you're setting up a portable uh, station. Very helpful for that kind of activity. Propagation. Um, what can we say about that? Well, the tropospheric propagations do vary in the, like they do in the VHF and the UHF bands. So you can hear, you know, QSB, you can have fading, you can have enhancements, you can have periods when the propagation seems to be better than others due to, uh, you know, conditions that we're all familiar with in the, in the UHF and, and VHF bands. So, again, this is perhaps where the beacons are useful to, for, for letting you know that maybe... Uh, you know, signals are, are better from a certain direction than they might have been perhaps from the last time you were out in that location when you when you monitored the, the beacons then. Um, but uh, as I said right at the beginning, there, there is a kind of a, um, uh, a belief in some quarters that, that, you know, microwaves are all about line of sight, but this is not true. You can make uh, QSOs that are uh, benefiting from refraction uh, over obstructions and, and from reflections, and both of these can enable QSOs. And uh, as an example, in the plot below, this is a 24 gigahertz uh, plot from, um, I think this is, uh, yeah, Walbury Hill, of course it is, I was there yesterday, uh, to somewhere towards Wales, I think it was Walsh Station, I've forgotten now. Um, this is a 122 kilometer path, uh, which is actually quite good on 24 gigahertz. But you can see, even then, there is one obstruction here, but only a slight obstruction. So there's probably some refraction over this edge, and um, that might have helped to, to make that QSO possible. Um, and we may have heard some uh, some perturbation in the signal levels due to that, not a sort of solid uh, direct signal path, uh, but certainly enough to, to make a QSO. Um, and if you, if you think about the distances uh, involved, um, this is just kind of my, uh, my sort of rule of, well, not rule of thumb, but, but estimation. I think on 23 SEMs, once you want to, if you're trying to get over a thousand kilometer uh, distance, then it, that's really very challenging. On 10 gigahertz, anything above 300K, I think becomes quite challenging. Um, and again, on 24, uh, the paths above 100 kilometers also become quite challenging. So it goes on as frequencies go up, unless of course you work EME or something like that, which uh, which obviously is, uh, is, is, is a slightly different scenario. 
Uh, but the main thing is that it's definitely not just line of sight. Over the visible horizon, it is definitely possible. So it is, you know, uh, entirely uh, possible that you can work uh, distant stations that maybe other stations don't work for whatever reason, um, you know, which can uh, bring in the uh, competitive element to these, uh, to the, to these events. Other interesting uh, phenomena is uh, rain scatter. Uh, rain scatter opportunities exist, especially in the 10 and 24 gigahertz uh, bands. And, uh, and in this case, you can, um, it, uh, the two stations can point their antennas not directly at each other, but away uh, towards uh, a heavy rain cell. And uh, you can use uh, rain radar maps, weather maps to, to identify where they are. And uh, if you're lucky, it's not guaranteed, but if you're lucky, there will be some uh, reflection off, uh, off that rain cell and, um, and you'll be able to uh, make a QSO, even though you're not pointing directly at each other. Um, the signals can be quite strong. I've certainly seen them uh, uh, without any difficulty in the 10 gigahertz band and in the 24 gigahertz band. Um, but they tend to be scattered. So the, the effect of the, the rain, I guess, or the Doppler shift and everything tends to spread the uh, signal. Uh, and if it's very spread, then this can make single sideband quite difficult to resolve. And uh, sometimes uh, you have to resort to perhaps CW in order to get the information over. Probably not unlike, uh, I guess, a rural type of uh, signals as well. So maybe a little bit like that, but certainly an opportunity. Um, to, uh, to, to make QSO so that might not normally be uh, possible. Um, you can also use artificial uh, <laughs> uh, um, opportunities like uh, aircraft. And um, this is a, this is a well-known uh, technique, especially in the uh, bands down at uh, 23 centimeters and at 13 centimeters. And uh, actually, I'm not sure if people make much use in 3.4 uh, and 5.7, but it's probably possible. I think the um, uh, it becomes more challenging as the frequency goes up, probably because of the antenna pointing is more, is the antennas are narrower, um, and so on. But this is where you can uh, you can use a reflection of a, of a high altitude aircraft to make a, a long path. In order to enable this, there is a utility that has been developed by a German um, amateur DL2 ALF called Air Scout. And uh, this takes uh, feeds from uh, live aircraft uh, air traffic data and provides you with a prediction of when the path between you and a remote station might be possible um, due to uh, uh, aircraft uh, crossing that path. And it tells you where in the path the, uh, the reflections will occur. So if we look on this plot on the picture, these are the two stations, kind of obviously. Um, and then in the middle, there's a kind of purple section. May not be too clear on this slide. This is the area of the path where the reflections are possible because the aircraft in that area are visible to both stations. And this shows us the uh, incoming aircraft that are likely to cross the path. And if you click on these aircraft, you can get information about how long it'll take before they cross the path. So you can start to get ready um, with the remote station to uh, make a very quick uh, QSO. The reflection tends to be quite short-lived, but it can be quite strong, um, and uh, certainly strong enough and long enough to to make a uh, contest uh, exchange. Um, and uh, several uh, stations are, are very uh, practiced at using air, air aircraft uh, scatter and these reflections to make uh, cont uh, contacts onto the onto the near continent. Obviously, if stations are too close, it doesn't work because uh, you can't see the common airspace um, or the, the too low, basically. Uh, and if the stations are too far away, then they're, you know, beyond the uh, the range where you can see this common uh, airspace that the aircraft can sit in. But a very useful uh, tool and uh, something that is used quite uh, successfully by a number of stations. I think it takes a bit of practice, really, to to get um, you know really familiar with this, but um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, so operating uh, specifics, um, logging, you know, is probably uh, similar to, to to really the um, you know the contest logging in, in the VHF and UHF uh, bands. Quite often, uh, we use the well-known uh, Minos uh, software. 
um, that has a facility to cover the microwave bands. Well, in sense of they're included in the in the tables of frequencies in the uh, in the software tool. Um, so you can enter results for any of the contests above one gigahertz right up to 245 uh, gigahertz. It includes the uh, usual range of uh, bonus systems where these are applicable in, for example, the UK ACs, where there are, are locator square bonuses and so on. Um, and it can account for eight-figure QRA locators if you're in a contest in the very high frequencies that requires the, the use of those. And again, for the results, <clears throat> the uh, obviously the RSGB contests would go into the regular RSGB contest committee pages. So nothing different there really for, for, for these contests compared to UHS and VHF events. Um, the UHF microwave group for its own contest uses a very similar interface. Uh, actually, uh, it looks almost the same. Uh, if you go into the UK microwave group, um, and then you can look onto the, the relevant web pages to find, well, not only claim scores in the first instance, which are always very interesting, but also the actual adjudicated results. Um, it, as people are very familiar with, I think probably in the UHF, VHF uh, frequencies, results are published in RADCOM. I think they are anyway. Uh, and uh, certainly the UK microwave group uh, web pages and uh, the UK microwave group uh, publication Scatterpoint has all the result tables and, and things published in, in, in that publication on a regular uh, basis. So I think this is nothing new here, really. Um, so again, you know, if you're familiar with contesting and the lower bands, then you'll have no difficulty uh, being engaged in these activities in, uh, if they relate to a microwave uh, band. However, you can win fabulous silverware. Look at this. You can win fabulous silverware that you can uh, place in your display cabinet in your in your home and uh, enthrall your uh, relatives uh, for all of three minutes. Um, <laughs> um, but hey ho, this is fun. So, um, but the, oh, the rules. I forgot about the rules. So, so there are similar rules in the VHF VHF contest, but some additional aspects. I forgot to mention these that are relevant to the, the microwave bands. Robing stations is one. So in the very high frequencies, you can rove. So you can work a bunch of stations on say, uh, let's say 24 gigahertz, because I know it happens there. And then if you feel so inclined, you can up sticks and move your station at least five kilometers. And then you can work all those stations again from the new location, which uh, you know is quite interesting because first of all, it gives you a chance to work some more stations over a different path. Um, maybe work some stations that you couldn't see from the original location and uh, it generally sort of increases the, the level of activity which is good. You can also have one-way contacts uh, for half points so quite often you might find that people are, maybe they have some problems with their gear but they can receive and they but they're not transmitting well um, and you don't lose all the opportunities to take part. You can you can score a contact for, for one way um, for half the points in which case one half of the exchange is, is taken takes place on the, the talkback channel, whichever that may be. And having uh, observed all those rules and pulled all those results in, as I say, you can uh, receive these lovely bits of silverware. There are trophies for, for a number of contests there. You can see the first four are to do with the UK microwave group for various bands. And the RSGB also has awards for the trophy contests and so on. So there are prizes to be won, as well as just having uh, kudos. Um, in addition, of course, if you are operating, uh, as I say, really contesting in these bands is not really just the contesting, it's generally operating, which is good. And so you might find that during your contest or activity period, you might make some kind of first contact with a station in a particular location. So those kind of options exist. Or you might be collecting squares. And of course, you might have the opportunity during the contest to, to, to work a new square on, on a gigahertz band. And uh, of course, these things can can happen uh, concurrently with the uh, with the contesting uh, events. And then, almost finally, um, I have to give you a little advertisement for for the UK Microwave Group, um, who are always looking for ways to try and encourage uh, new people and newcomers to uh, take part in activities in the microwave frequencies. And they have some equipment that you can borrow. Um, and they have some loan systems for um, the, the bands on the slide there, 5.7, 10, 24, and 76 gigahertz. 
in some cases a number of systems or two in, in 10 gigahertz and two in 24 gigahertz. Um, these can be loaned. Um, you can probably, uh, if you were very interested for perhaps to try 10 gigahertz per season, you could probably borrow a 10 gigahertz system for, for almost a whole summer season uh, to take place in a number of events. And um, this will give you a nice feel for, for you know, operating with, with some equipment, which hopefully is, uh, is, is working well and uh, easy to, to maintain and set up and use. So please, if you're you know really thinking about this, this is a nice way to to try out some of these uh, new frequencies. And I think with me, that's it. And uh, yeah, 56 minutes, that's a little bit longer than I anticipated. So I thank you for listening if you've stayed the course. And uh, I guess it's uh, back to you, David, and um, to see if we have any, any questions. Thank you. Well, thanks very All much, right. Harry. Well, you take a well and uh drink and a little break. Um, this is a good call for you now at home. If you haven't already made a comment or question for Barry um, and you haven't already done so, as I said, please put it now on the YouTube chat or BATC messaging. And please don't include, forget to include your first name and a call sign as well if you do have one. Um, Barry, I'm going to start actually um, with, with a question that we have been asked um, by, I'm just trying to find it there, Steve G4HTZ. He says, hi, Barry, would you recommend investing in 23 SEMs until the outcome of the Galileo is known at the conference in December, where it's possible we may lose some or all of the bands? Now, of course, um, maybe for some context as well, you maybe could mention your, your connection with the IARU at this point. Yeah, OK, so uh, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Steve, for... Uh, for for, for that question, I had a feeling that uh, something like this might uh, might come up today. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so for the IARU, actually, I uh, I help them out as a volunteer to lead on their uh, on on the way they deal with this um, <clears throat> uh, topic on the WRC twenty three agenda item relating to twenty three centimeters and the radio navigation satellite service in the band twelve forty to to thirteen hundred. Whether you should invest in equipment, well, I don't know. I mean, it's not for me to, you know. <laughs> I mean, there is a chance, there is a high chance that we will uh, have some restrictions on how we use some parts of the band. And, you know, our job in the IRU has been very much to try and ensure uh, two things. First of all, that we can continue to operate all the applications that we have in the band, and by that I mean TV, I mean contesting, I mean EME, I mean, you know, Peter operation, whatever you like, um, in some way. Um, so we want to be able to make it so that, so that all those opportunities can still exist somehow in the band. And as far as possible, to try to, let's say, minimize the um, constraints and technical restrictions that we might have. Now, at the moment, I know there's been some uh, discussion in some quarters recently. People are seeing some of the proposals that are being made, but I really super stress that these are still in progress and still everything is on the table. Nothing is agreed or decided or finalized at this point in time. So, you know, we're, we're trying to work very hard in this very formal environment that this activity takes place in to minimize the, um, you know, what, what may come out from our perspective. Now, having said that, I think you can, you can imagine that um, in a kind of a spectrum sharing scenario, very high power, for example, is probably going to be very difficult to argue for. So you could imagine that uh, probably if you were investing in, in a high power PA uh, that was going to cost you a lot of money, then probably you might want to uh, just hold off a little while to see how that goes um but you know the the end result depends on a lot of people it depends not only on the outcome of the d discussions at wrc it depends on how formal the outcome is made it depends on how all the regulators uh, react to those proposals um you know some of them may decide to ignore them but some of them may decide they don't need to to enforce these measures so you know there's still a, a degree of unpredictability about what may happen um, except that something will happen. Um, 
So I don't know if that brings you any uh, comfort, Steve. Um, but that would be my uh, my, my sort of um, advice, if you want to call it that, for, for for the time being. We have to watch this space, really. So maybe just hold off on any big investments, especially on <laughs> well, you know, higher power sort of equipment in particular. Well, right? I think to be sensible, I, I, I would, yeah. Okay. But don't take that my word. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. You have to make your own, uh, develop your own view on that. But uh, yeah, this is, the situation could make it a little bit um, tricky. Understand. Thank you for the, uh, for the warning on that. Um, we've got another question now from Simon, GM0SCA. He says, hi, Barry. Interesting talk. Thank you. Do you think the new ICOM IC9005, uh, albeit very expensive, will increase portable activities um, and it would seem to suit black box operators like black box sorry, operators like me, he says. So maybe we should mention this is a new ICOM transceiver. It's just I think this last week mm. been priced mm. around about three thousand, three and a half thousand pounds, but has all the bands. You, 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 I don't know if you're familiar. I'm reasonably familiar with it. I think it starts at uh, sort of VHF and goes right up to quite high microwaves, doesn't it? Uh, yes, my I think it covers, if I remember right, um, well, obviously 1.3, but I think it co covers 2.3, uh, 5.6, and you can get an option, I think, to cover uh, the 10, 10 gigahertz. 10 gigahertz this, is yes. what I, this is what I, I recall, I think, from what I've seen uh, of the uh, of the equipment. And, and you know, it's, it has a kind of look about it, uh, like most microwave um, kind of setups. There seems to be a kind of a baseband unit and a kind of a transverter unit, which sort of sits separately to the uh, to the main transceiver, um, which is quite a common um, sort of arrangement for, for, for people even who are home brewing equipment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's good to see that, um, you know, the commercial concern is, is taking an interest in this. Uh, to, to enough to, to develop uh, commercial product for these bands, and um, yeah, we we can only hope that uh, the availability of this kind of equipment could, um, you know, increase the activity. I suppose at the end of the day, like everything, um, you know, it's some people might view that as uh, quite expensive, um, but you know, if you uh, compare it to, for example, uh, some of the German-made uh, transverter systems. You know, even one of those can be approaching, let's say, you know, seven, eight hundred pounds worth of kit, uh, maybe even a little bit more to make a full transverter if you buy it, if you take that kind of route. So maybe, you know, for those who are less uh, cost sensitive, it certainly would be interesting. And I think that the, if I remember rightly, the 10 gigahertz unit, I think, requires an additional or optional add on, uh, which probably increases the cost a little bit. But um, yeah, I think it's really encouraging that, that at least, um, you know, it's a good start and maybe other manufacturers will follow. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a nice, uh, relatively uh, easy route to, to take. So let's, fingers crossed that it does increase activity because that's certainly something we would like to see in, in the uh, microwave band. Yeah, as you say, it's very nice to see a commercial piece of equipment like that, um, you know, brand new. And quite state of the art, I think you know, with yeah. the, all those high bands right up to ten gigs, uh, but quite a lot and of, of money. And of course, it has <clears> all the nice, nice facilities with the, you know, the waterfall display and all this kind of thing. And all these are these are all very helpful features for for operating in these bands, where maybe it's a bit tricky sometimes to to find the signal that you're looking for. So all good mm. stuff. Yes, yeah. uh, but of course, a lot of people haven't got those sort of thousands of pounds to spend on something like this. And, they, and, and enjoy experimenting. And I'm glad to see that you mentioned the UK Microwave Group, who um, I must admit, uh, it was nice to meet them at the RSGB convention last year. Uh, I remember interviewing one of their representatives there. Um, and it's incredibly, uh, I'm sure you don't mind, uh, nobody minds a plug here, because it's six pounds, I remember, for UK membership. Yeah. I think it was about $9 for U US and similar sort of amount for European members. So it's very, very low cost. I did actually just look at the web address for anybody looking. I'm sure if you just type in UK Microwave Group, it will come up in your browser. But uh, if not, it's microwavers.org. So that might be a good way to, a very low cost way of joining a, an organization that can help you. I know they had quite a lot of components and, and encourage self-build as well. So if, if you can't afford some of the commercial equipment, that might be a good way to start with microwaves. I know that tonight's talk's really mainly about contesting, but of course, 
I guess as UK as our microwave manager in the RSGB, Barry, you're keen to encourage lots of use of, of the microwave bands, not just with contesting. Well, uh, absolutely, and um, you know this was the kind of um, point really that that the that the good thing about contesting in a way is that it does encourage this activity, um, uh, and you know it is certainly true that these contest events or scheduled activity periods, whatever you want to call them. Uh, do uh, do exactly that because you need to, you know, you need to know if you're going to put your heart and soul into uh, putting together some kind of home brew, let's say microwave system. You know, you need to want to know that you can get out and and, and test it. I know there'll be other people on the air to to do so. But yeah, absolutely right about the UK microwave group. I mean, I can I'm quite happy to plug them too because I'm a member of of, of them also. In fact, I'm I'm sort of the Sort of representative between the UK Micro Group and the RSGB is my my role as the microwave manager, um, and as you say, the subs are are, are very very, very uh, inexpensive. You get the regular uh, magazine, uh, the Scatterpoint magazine, um, and you know component service. Um, it provides components free to 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 the members of the of the group. Things like tricky surface mount componentry and this kind of thing. Um, and there's also uh, a wiki. Uh, section where you can find some information on, you know, antennas and, and equipment and transverters and all sorts of things like that. And we, we encourage experimenters to, you know, publish their information on the wiki and that kind of thing so that the, the, that everybody can can benefit from uh, from that. Mm, so sort of collaborate and everything. So Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you've got any, uh, as well as comments and questions for Barry, but if you've got any good experiences with um, microwaves yourself, then it's not too late to pop them onto BATC uh, or to uh, YouTube messaging as well. Um, Barry G6JMZ, uh, sorry, JMX says, has anyone tried it when snowing? I don't know which band that was on, but I guess how does <laughs> snow affect the microwave bands? Well, you know, if it can be tried, everyone's tried it, right? So, <laughs> yes, for sure. And I think uh, I remember, uh, I think, seeing some uh, results of a bit of experimentation in, uh, I think it was 24 gigahertz, where some stations observed snow scatter, um, you know, in the, in the right weather conditions, in the right, in the right direction when they occurred. So uh, yeah, absolutely for sure. You know, you could see these these, these types of, uh, or you could see effects from these these kind of weather events. I mean, the, the difficulty is, of course, that if you're out contesting and you want to take advantage of them, is that you know you can pretty much guarantee that when you want those type of weather conditions to exist, they're not, and when you don't, they are. So when you don't want it to be raining, it's probably teeming down on your head um, in the wrong place. Um, and so on. So this is always the, the challenge to get the weather in the right place. But certainly I know people have, have seen the effect of snow, sleet, rain. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but, <laughs> you know, it, it will have been tried for sure. That covers quite a lot, I think, Barry. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions I was going to ask you about, Michael, and we're used to, whether you're contesting or just general operating at HF and VHF and UHF, some of us have beams and, and you know directional antennas but a lot of us have things like collinears or antennas which aren't terribly critical but most of the pictures that you've shown tonight and, and indeed I think if we were to ask people thinking about microwaves most of us would think of a dish I know you can get a 1.2 gigs uh, collinear but is this really does I mean all, all obviously that does is it spreads out the signal to being all over the place or omnidirectional rather than unidirectional so is that pretty hopeless to be having a sort of a universal um uh, sorry unidirectional uh, antenna is pretty essential for contesting at microwaves um certainly for the for the uh, higher higher frequencies I mean you could and um, people may know of course that in the 1.3 gigahertz band we do have uh, a number of uh, 1.3 gigahertz repeaters. So it's a kind of a crossover between what we do in the VHF, UHF bands and the higher uh, microwave bands, um, which means that you could you could have some perhaps mobile operations in the 1.3 gigahertz band. But of course, this would be more for local uh, operations uh, rather than for, for contesting activities and that kind of thing. Certainly for contesting, you need to have a good performance uh, antenna um, you need to have uh, the, the higher gain because the losses go up as the frequency goes up. 
Um, I guess that's why you put, sometimes put the equipment at the top of the mast, like you were talking about well, the 10 gig, so you don't have the losses down the cable? Absolutely. All these are factors that are important if you're setting up a station, which is why, you know, in the final picture you can see on the slide here, I showed my transverter sitting behind a dish because it minimizes the uh, uh, feeder loss, and, which is all important things if you want to minimize the, uh, uh, the, noise, uh, the noise figure of the system and so on and pick out those weak signals. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly uh, high gain antennas, but it doesn't have to be a dish as such. Um, you can use uh, quite often in the lower bands 2.4 and 3.4, for example, you can find surplus panel uh, antennas um, or maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, 18 inches square, something like that. They can have a reasonable amount of gain and can be good enough to make uh, QSOs. So they could be quite uh, practical. So it's not always about a parabolic dish. Um, but of course, you know, they, they tend to give you the, uh, uh, the best performance. And as you go up in, in frequency, they become very convenient because at 10 gigahertz, there's a good supply of uh, sky dishes and, uh, and feeds and things like this and elements from those systems that can be used to, to put together a system that can operate in the amateur bands. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, microwaves will use anything that might work, right? So if it's available and uh, it looks like we can uh, tune it or tweak it or, or plug a transverter into it, then we'll try it for sure. I remember the very, first thing, the very first thing I made was many years ago, I went to a BATC convention and someone was selling a kit with an old uh, burger alarm sort of microwave feed horn um, oh, yes. and a very basic circuit, incredibly yeah, yeah. simple circuit with an audio yeah. amplifier as the driver. Yeah. Um, and I just couldn't believe this is going to work. And then an analog, I think it was an Amstrad uh, satellite receiver to pick up, that was always interested in video and sending yeah. the video over that. I just couldn't believe it worked. So microwave doesn't have to be incredibly complex, does it? No, um, and what you're referring to are the old days of the uh, the old salt fan heads and this kind of thing, I think they were, were, were called, uh, where you could do easily do video, analog video or analog voice, just merely by modulating the power supply on a on a. a, a a, a varactor diode in, inside a piece of waveguide. But of course, these days, um, you know, if you really want to make the competitive kind of QSOs, then you need to have uh, something that's a little bit more controlled in terms of the, the bandwidth and the noise figure and this kind of thing, because those heads have a very high noise figure. There's no low noise amplifier or anything in front of them. Um, and, and these days, there's really no excuse not to be able to have a, a very stable and frequency accurate uh, system. People use uh, GPS um, to, to provide timing signals. People can be almost spot on frequency, even, you know, in high bands at 10, 24 gigahertz, you know, certainly well within the, uh, the bandwidth of a single sideband uh, signal without too much uh, uh, trouble. So those days of the sort of very variable sort of soul fan heads, I mean, they were great and, and they provided a great route for experimentation. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, you can you could probably do some TV or something in you know, over a short range with those kind of heads. So certainly for experimentation. And actually, I'm reminded that in France, some people were using um, antenna systems from proximity uh, sensors, which came on a little patch again, patch antennas, um, to make a, a frequency modulated system, which is actually the easiest type of uh, system to make. And actually, the current um, 122 gigahertz systems, which are very popular in the last uh, two years or so, fairly popular, I shall I say, um, they also work on, uh, by generating, mainly by generating frequency modulated signals, which are relatively easy to, uh, to, to generate. So, yes, there are, there are uh, easier ways to, to generate signals. Um, but yeah, and, and that's a good start. But then you'll find that if you want to be really competitive, you've got to refine your system. And that's what the experimentation is all about, right? Abs absolutely, yeah. Um, and um, we've, we've given a shout out for the UK Microwave Group. We should also mention the British Amateur Television Club because if you're yeah. interested in the video side of the hobby and contesting as well, then they also have adopted a lot of the high frequency bands now. Uh, lots of great projects, the Portstown projects and things like that. And you can find absolutely. out more about that on uh, batc.org.uk as well. Barry, thank you very much indeed for tonight's insight. I just want to, I mean, lots of people saying thank you very much, great talk and things like that. I want to give a shout out though to somebody who mentioned something earlier. Uh, it's Ernie Tech, uh, that's the name. I don't have a call sign from that, but I think probably from the States. 
Um, he's from the Mount Airy VHF radio group in Philadelphia. Uh, he mentions that that's been dedicated to VHF and UHF since 1956 and also the Delaware Valley Radio Association. Actually, this talk, Ernie, has been more about microwaves rather than VHF, UHF. But anyway, I want to give you a, a shout out because it was nice that you mentioned uh, us earlier on. Once again, many, many thanks tonight, Barry. Uh, I'm sure okay. it's given a lot of people inspiration, not just to try contesting at microwaves, but just to even just experiment with, with, con with uh, microwaves themselves. Yeah. So thank you for tonight, and also thanks for your work as the microwave manager of the RSGB as well. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, David. And uh, we'd certainly be uh, very, very happy to see some new call signs coming onto the, uh, onto the microwave bands, absolutely for sure. So, uh, yeah, get experimenting. Thank you. Many thanks. And that concludes this webinar. And thanks once again to our guest presenter, Barry Lewis, G4SJH. And also thanks to the RSGB team who work on this series behind the scenes. We hope you've enjoyed this tonight today. And if you'd like to see details of this and future webinars or recordings of past editions, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. Now, looking ahead to next month, and tonight today will be on April the 3rd, with a talk about an amateur-built high-altitude balloon flight and recovery system with Heather Nichols M0 HMO. And the RSGB AGM will be held online on Saturday the 15th of April. You'll hear more about the Society, find out the results of the board director elections, and this year you'll be able to ask questions via the live chat, as well as submitting them in advance if you prefer. There'll also be a presentation by the RSGB Propagation Studies Committee Chair, Steve Nichols, G0KYA, who will explain how the weekly GB2RS propagation reports are compiled. Well, full details about the AGM will be in the April edition of RADCOM and on the RSGB website from the 15th of March at rsgb.org forward slash AGM. And finally, a tip that if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. So until next time, this is David G7ERP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.